Good morning. Uh, today is the second lecture in the series of lectures on structural analysis. In the previous lecture, we discussed how to calculate the static indeterminacy of a structure. Today, we are going to be discussing how to compute the kinematic indeterminacy of the structure. kinematic indeterminacy. What do we mean by the kinematic? The static indeterminacy you saw last time was essentially how to compute the number of redundant forces that you have in the system which if you removed would make the structure statically determinate and you could then solve and find out all the forces in the structure purely by equa using equations of equilibrium. Now, kinematic indeterminacy, this is a completely different concept altogether, although in other words, the word kinematic indeterminacy is actually a misnomer. Uh, it is more commonly known as the degrees of freedom that a structure has. What is this? Degrees of freedom. What exactly is, th is this? If you were to describe it in words, it is the minimum number of displacement quantities that you require to know before you can get, define the displaced geometry of the structure. Okay. Now, uh, so, therefore, if you look at this, this is completely different. Although we are using the same word indeterminacy, uh, it is a completely different concept. The previous one referred to how to find out the forces in the structure. This one is referring to how to find out the displaced geometry of the structure when it is subjected to loads. And note, the kinematic indeterminacy is the minimum number of displacement, independent displacement quantities that you need to define to be able to get the complete displaced geometry of the structure. Let us look at a structure and what I will do again just as I did in the last lecture where I looked at two different types of structures. One set of structures which are made up of only actually loaded members. If you remember, those are trusses. So, I am going to start off with trusses because even uh, trusses and beams and frames which are essentially structures made up of members which can deform flexurally uh, are different. The treatment is different. Let us look at a truss and again I go back to the simple truss that I had last time. simple truss. Now, we want to find out what the kinematic indeterminacy of this truss structure is. Before that, I need to define what a kinematically determinate, remember, it is very easy for you to know how to get the statically determinate structure. You know when you look at it what a statically determinate structure looks like. How do you see a static a kinematically indeterminate structure. Let us take this same structure and I want to make this kinematically indeterminate. How will I make it kinematically indeterminate? This is a kinematically determinate structure. Why is this kinematically determinate? Let us look at this structure. See, understand what is kinematic indeterminacy? It is the minimum number of displacement quantities that you need to define 
the displaced shape of a structure. Let's look at this structure. How will it displace? Under loads, how will it deform? Let's look at this. Can this point go anywhere? This point cannot go anywhere because it's restrained both in this direction as well as this direction. It cannot move anywhere on the plane. That means this point cannot go anywhere. Can this point go anywhere? Neither can this point go anywhere. Can this point go anywhere? Again, it can't. Simply because every point has a hinge which restrains the displacements in the plane of the structure. Okay. So, what would be the displaced shape of the structure if it were subjected to loads? Think about it. Let's put some loads on the structure. These are the possible loads on a truss structure because remember a truss structure can only be loaded at the joints. So, I put all possible loads that can be this structure can be subjected to. What would be the displaced shape under these loads? Remember nothing. This under these loads all these loads would get directly transferred to the supports and the structure will not be subjected to any stress. So, therefore, there is going to be zero strain and since there is going to be zero strain, there is going to be no displacement. So, what is a kinematically determinate structure? A structure that does not displace. Simple. Okay. Is that interesting? Well, currently it is not interesting. Later on, we will see that we need to define a kinematically determinate structure before we can use what is known as the displacement method of analyzing statically indeterminate structures. Okay. Once we have a kinematically determinate structure, now it is very easy to look at this structure and see how this structure or what is going to be the kinematic indeterminacy or the degrees of freedom of this structure. Let us look at it. This point, can it go anywhere? No. Again, it is there is a hinge which is restraining it from moving anywhere. Can this point go anywhere? What is the restraint? The only restraint is it cannot move vertically. Okay? It cannot move vertically. So, therefore, but is there any restraint for moving it horizontally? No. So, this is a possible displacement. This node can displace in this direction and therefore, this horizontal displacement is a degree of freedom of the structure. Let us look at this point now. Can this point go anywhere? Note that this point can go anywhere on this plane. And in a plane, how many displacements do you require to define? Well, if you know, if you define two orthogonal displacement quantities, they completely define the displacement of this point anywhere in space. So, now if you look at it, this structure simple truss has three nodes. One node completely restrained cannot go anywhere. This node vertically restrained can move horizontally. This node free to displace in any way direction it wishes in the plane. So, it has we can define two displacement quantities which will define the motion of this point anywhere in space. Okay? So, now how many degrees of freedom or what is the kinematic indeterminacy of this structure? 1, 2, 3. So, the kinematic indeterminacy of this structure is equal to 3. Simple? Yes, very simple. So, therefore, if you have a truss, any joint in the truss can move in the plane. And what you need to look at is what are the restraints. So, now I can look at it this way. Let me redefine this problem. How many nodes? So, I am not going to do an algorithmic way of getting the kinematic indeterminacy. How many nodes this structure? This structure has three nodes. Right? Okay. 
So now for the movement of a node or a joint, you know, you can call this a joint too. Joint, node, same. So the movement of a joint in a plane is given by two independent displacement quantities. In other words, if I know those two displacement quantities, I know where the joint is in the space. So therefore, let's look at it this way. How many joints? Three. How many degrees of freedom per joint? Degrees of freedom are two per joint. So therefore, if this plane truss were to have no supports, what would be the degrees of freedom? It would be 2 into the number of joints, so it would be 6. So the degrees of freedom, 2 per joint multiplied by 3 is equal to 6. 6 degrees of freedom, since this truss has 3 joints. Now, this is the unrestrained degrees of freedom. In other words, the truss did not have any support. Then the number of degrees of freedom would be 6. However, you do have two supports in this structure. What are the supports? At one joint, you have a hinge. A hinge, what does it stop? It restrains. So, restraints. Restraints. At this node, a hinge will have two restraints. What are the two restraints? It stops it from moving vertically. It also stops it from moving horizontally. So, it does not allow this joint to go anywhere. So, it gives two restraints to this joint. Okay. What about this joint? This kind of roller joint. How many restraints does it give? It gives exactly one. It restrains the vertical motion of this joint. Okay? It gives 1. And 1 meaning 2 plus 1. So, the total number of restraints in this is 3. So, what is the restraint structure? How many degrees of freedom does it have? 3. Simple. Same kinematic indeterminacy by finding out the displacements and also the algorithmic way. Find out the number of joints in a truss multiply that by 2, that gives you the unrestrained degrees of freedom. You find out the number of restraints that the body has and then subtract those restraints and you have the degrees of freedom or the kinematic indeterminacy of the truss. Okay. Let us look at one another problem. Let us look at a slightly more complicated truss. Let me just take, draw another one. This is the truss. Okay? And if you look at this truss, we have to find out the kinematic indeterminacy. How would I go about it? Now, we are going to use only the algorithmic way of getting it. And then, I will show you which are those displacements. How many joints? 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. Joints. Four. So, what are the number of degrees of freedom? Note that kinematic indeterminacy and degrees of freedom are used interchangeably. Okay? So, what are the degrees of freedom per joint for a planar truss? Two degrees of freedom. So, what is the total number of unrestrained degrees of freedom? Unrestrained degrees of freedom is equal to 2 into 4. 8. Okay. So, that is the unrestrained degrees of freedom. Now, we need to find out what the restraints are. Restraints, here one hinge support, two restraints, one roller support, one restraint, 
So, 3. So, what is the total actual degrees of freedom? 8 minus 3, that is 5. So, the kinematic indeterminacy is 5 for this structure. Now, once I have defined the kinematic degrees of freedom, okay, you need to now see, well, that is a kinematic indeterminacy 5. Now, you always understand what kinematic, remember what kinematic indeterminacy is. What is it? The minimum number of displacement quantities that you need to define to be able to get the displaced geometry of the structure. So, now I need to find out and define those displacement degrees of freedom and note that I should have only 5 independent displacement degrees of freedom. Let us find out. Let us look at this note. Any degrees of freedom at this node? No. Both of them are restrained. Let us go to join 2. Restrained? None. What are the degrees of freedom? 1, 2. Let us go to 3. Any restraint? No. What are the degrees of freedom? 1, 2. The vertical displacement and the horizontal displacement. What about 4? Well, it is restrained in this direction. It is not restrained in this direction. So, now how many do I have? I have 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, 5 degrees of freedom, 5 kinematic indeterminacy. So, therefore, it should be fairly easy for you now to get the kinematic indeterminacy of a truss type structure. Planar truss, 2 degrees of freedom. Space truss, 3 degrees of freedom because you need 3 displacement quantities to define the position of a point in space. 3 independent x displacement, y displacement and z displacement. Now, what with unrestrained degrees of freedom for a space truss? 3 into the number of joints that will be the unrestrained and then you find out the number of restraints that you have which are what are the restraints the support conditions the supports the restraints provided by the supports subtract the restraints you've got the degrees of freedom for a truss and that defines your kinematic indeterminacy or for a truss structure now let's move on to that for a frame well let me start off before i go for a frame let me start off with a simple one which is a beam. Let us look at a beam. <coughs> so, let me look at a very, very simple beam. This is a structure that you are all familiar with. What is this? A simply supported beam. Okay. What is the static indeterminacy of the simply supported beam? 0, you know that. It is a statically determinate structure. But now we are not looking at static indeterminacy. We are looking at kinematic indeterminacy. Now note, you will say, well, again, there are two joints, two nodes in the structure, right? And you can say, well, why do not we use the same thing as a truss? Every node to, for it to move in the space for it to move it in the plane, there will be 2 degrees of freedom okay? and 2 nodes, 2 degrees of freedom. Let me define that there are how many? 3 restraints. So, this is kinematical. So, if you use the truss model, 2 into 2, 2 nodes, 2 degrees of freedom per node, that is 4 and there are 3 restraints, 2 here and 1 here and 1 degree of freedom. What is that one degree of freedom? This one. Is that correct? Is this a single kinematically indeterminate structure or single degree of freedom? No. Because you have to understand that members in a beam and frame behave differently from a truss. A truss is only an actually loaded member. So, all we need to know is where the two joints at the end of a truss member is and that gives us the elongation of the truss and from that we can find out the force in the truss. Simple? Yes. Can we do that for a beam? No. Why? Because the, you have to understand that the whole 
concept of a beam, the behavior of a beam, the way it's loaded. How is a beam loaded? It's loaded in this manner. What happens to the beam? The beam goes like this. You see? So therefore, the entire concept of displacement, degrees of freedom for a beam and a frame would be different from that from a truss and that is why we need to look at it differently. Okay. So now, how do we look at it differently and that is where an important point comes in. A joint that has, that connects beam members or frame members in addition to the two degrees of freedom which define its movement also has another additional degree of freedom. What does that do? That degree of freedom actually defines the movement of the members relative to each other and what is that? And that degree of freedom is the rotation degree of freedom. Okay. So, therefore, whenever you look at a beam or a frame, every joint when it is unrestrained has three degrees of freedom. So, a joint has three degrees of freedom. What does this degree of freedom do? Look at it, think of this. Let me fix this. If I fix this and this, this disappears because this cannot go up or down. Does that mean that, remember that if I say, if I have a kinematically determinate structure, I can define the displaced geometry of the structure completely. Can I? Think about it. If I restrain this and I restrain this, Okay, both the displacements are restrained. Both the displacements are restrained means what? No displacement. But is that true? No. Under this load, it displaces in this manner. So, therefore, understand that I require additional displacement quantities to define the displaced shape of the structure. And what are those? Look at this. This rotation and this rotation. These two rotations gives me the displaced shape of the structure. Okay? So, therefore, that is that additional degree of freedom that I need to define. So, therefore, whenever you have a beam or a frame, you have three degrees of freedom per joint. Now, let us come back to this structure that I had, the simply supported beam. How many degrees of freedom does it have? Now, let us look at it. How many joints? Two. How many degrees of freedom for the unrestrained degrees of freedom? Three per joint. So, total six. Right? Except that six. Okay. Number of restraints? Note that this hinge support still restrains only two which is that this displacement and this displacement. Okay? So, it has two restraints and how many this? One. So, what is the total number of restraints? Three. So, what is the degrees of freedom? Three. So, in other words, this simply supported beam has three degrees of freedom or its kinematic indeterminacy is equal to three. Now, so fine, kinematic indeterminacy is 3. What is kinematic indeterminacy? Number of di unknown displacement quantities. Let us find those out for this. Just like we did in the truss, we should be able to write it for this one. Let us write. What are those? Note that this allows, the restrains this, but allows this. So, this is a degree of freedom. That is my first degree of freedom. Then, this is a pin roller, right? So, it allows free rotation. So, this is another degree of freedom. This one, this joint restrains both the motions, but allows it to rotate and that is my third degree of freedom.
So, in other words, this simply supported beam, if I knew the horizontal displacement of this point and the rotation at this point and the rotation at this point, I would be able to give you how this structure has displaced. So, if I knew these displacement quantities, I could draw the displaced geometry of the structure. Okay? So, this in essence defines the kinematic indeterminacy for beams and frames. I just want to introduce one more joint that you are all familiar with and so I will take up another statically determinate structure, this is a cantilever, a cantilever beam. What is the kinematic indeterminacy of this cantilever beam? Well, let us go, how many no joints? One, two, so two joints, two. So how many unrestrained degrees of freedom? Again six unrestrained degrees of freedom are 6. So, now you need to find out the number of restraints. How many restraints? Well, let us look at this joint. What is this joint? This is a fixed support. What is a fixed support? A fixed support is one which restrains the point from displacing in any direction. It also restrains the rotation of that point. In other words, how will this thing displace? This will displace something like this. At this point, the slope would be 0, the displacements both vertically and horizontally would be 0. Okay? So, completely restrained. Okay. What about this point? It is not restrained, it does not have any support. How many restraints? What does this restrain? It restrains vertical, horizontal and rotation. So, there are 3 restraints. So, the kinematic indeterminacy? What are those three? One, two, three. Simple. Okay. So, for a beam, you should be able to get the kinematic indeterminacy or the number of degrees of freedom for the structure. Okay. Now, let us move on to a frame. Kinematic indeterminacy for a frame. And let me look at a simple frame. Okay. Now, note I just said that the kinematic indeterminacy for both a beam and a frame are computed in exactly the same fashion. Okay. So, I can use the same algorithm that I developed for the beam. Look at this. How many nodes? 1, 2, 3, 4. So, there are 4 joints in this structure. So, following my procedure, each joint unrestrained has 3 degrees of freedom. So, the number of unrestrained degrees of freedom, unrestrained degrees of freedom is equal to 3 into 4, 12. So, unrestrained degrees of freedom is 12. Now, we need to find out what are the restraints in the structure. How many supports? Two supports. What are those two supports? One here, one here. What are they? Fixed supports. How many restraints does the fixed support give? 3. So, how many fixed supports? 2. So, what are the restraints? 6, 2 into 3, 2 supports, fixed supports with 3 restraints each. So, how many degrees of freedom? 6. Kinematic indeterminacy, remember, is the same as degrees of freedom, 6. What are they? Now, I should be able to draw them. What are they? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The vertical, horizontal and the rotation of this joint, the vertical, horizontal and rotation of this joint. 3 per node, 6 degrees of freedom. If I know these 6 displacement quantities, I can draw the displaced shape of this frame. Simple. Now, I want to bring in the concept of constraints. You see, typically what we do is, 
when we consider beams and frames we tend to neglect the what we need to stop something right we why what do we not consider in a beam or a frame generally we tend to say that neglect the actual deformations why because by and large in a beam and a frame the main way that the loads are transferred in a beam and a frame are through flexural deformations. In other words, the structure bends to take the loads. Okay. And when you have flexural deformations and they are very large, the actual deformations they are there. Remember that. The actual deformations are not zero. It is that they are very small. Okay. And we tend to say that, well, forget it. You know, the structure is neglect the actual deformations. Okay. Now, when we neglect the actual deformations, what happens? Well, let us see. Let me go back. To my simply supported beam. I neglect the actual deformation of this member. Okay. I neglect. So, therefore, what am I saying? It is actually rigid. Now note, in general, you will see, think about it, when you find out for a statically determinate beam, what are the forces that you normally find out? The shear force, bending moment. Do you ever find out the actual force? You don't. So therefore, implicitly without knowing, you are actually neglecting actual deformation. You never explicitly mention that okay? when you are analyzing a frame or a beam. You never explicitly state that. But you are implicitly assuming that the actual deformations are neglected. In other words, the member is actually rigid. So, what happens when, when you have a member which, which is actually rigid? What happens here is now that you are constraining the structure. It has an effect. It has no effect on the degree, uh, on the uh, static indeterminacy of the structure. Remember that. But it has a tremendous effect on the kinematic indeterminacy or the number of degrees of freedom that you get from a structure. You are constraining a structure. So, what do you do? Actually rigid. What does that mean? Let us look at this. When I say that this member is actually rigid, what am I doing? Think about it. Can this cannot go anywhere. This can move horizontally. Forget about the rotational degrees of freedom. I am looking only at the actual deformation. What happens? This can go this way. So, if this goes this way. What happens when this goes this way? What effectively happens to this member? This joint cannot go anywhere. This joint moves, can move horizontally. And when it moves horizontally, what happens? The member is either actually shortened or if the displacement is in this direction, it is elongated. In other words, this degree of freedom actually corresponds to the actual deformation of the body. Okay. And if this member is actually rigid, since this point is not going anywhere, can this point go anywhere? It can't. It is actually rigid. It cannot deform actually. If it cannot deform actually, this point cannot go anywhere. It means that I know this displacement. This displacement has to be zero. Okay. So therefore, do you understand what is happening? By making the structure actually rigid, what have I done? I have eliminated a degree of freedom. Now, if I say that this beam is actually rigid, how many degrees of freedom does this beam have? One, two, the two rotations. It is a two degree of freedom structure. Simple, okay, but how do I put it into my algorithm? You see, I always truly believe that unless you have an algorithmic way of computing static indeterminacy and kinematic indeterminacy, 
you are always going to flounder because you wouldn't know how many indeterminacies there are in the structure both static and kinematic. So, let us go back to the algorithmic way. How do I include this effect in the algorithmic way? So, let us go back. What we define is two joints, unrestrained degrees of freedom 2 into 3, 6, restraints 3 minus 3 and now what have I done by making it actually rigid constraining the structure. So, I say a new thing constraints. Constraints also reduce the number of degrees of freedom in the structure. Okay. In this case how many constraints? Think about it actually rigid what have I done? I have made this into 0. So, how many constraints do you think an actual rigidity in a member brings in? 1. Okay. Because a single degree of freedom defines the actual deformation of a body of a member. And so, when I make it actually rigid that is the constraint that I am additional constraint that I am giving that this body cannot deform actually. I am making one constraint per member. How many members are there in this structure? One. So, one minus one. How many degrees of freedom? Two. I have already shown you the degrees of freedom in the structure. So, algorithmic. So, uh, algorithm what is the algorithm for getting the kinematic indeterminacy of a beam or a frame? Start off by finding out how many joints there are in the structure. Multiply the number of joints by 3. That gives you the total number of unrestrained degrees of freedom. Then find out the restraints. What are the restraints? The supports. The restraints are provided always by supports. So, you find out go to every support and find out what kind of restraint it gives. Add up all the restraints from all the supports. Okay, Those are the num total number of restraints. Those are to be subtracted from the unrestrained degrees of freedom. Now, in addition to that you need to look at the constraints. Constraints. What are the constraints? Well, member is actually rigid. If a member is actually rigid, how many degrees of freedom? Constraint? single per member per member 1 okay and so you subtract the total number of constraints and you've got your degrees of freedom or the kinematic indeterminacy of the structure now let's go to the frame you might say how does this work let's go to the frame that we were looking at and i say that all the members are actually rigid members so, let us now see how I compute the degrees of freedom. How many joints? 1, 2, 3, 4. How many members? 1, 2, 3. Okay. Now, let us the unrestrained degrees of freedom. 4 joints, 3 into 4, 12. Restraints, two fixed supports. So, restraints, two fixed supports is two into three restraints, six. Constraints, how many members? One, all actually rigid. So, constraints, three. So, these are minus. How many degrees of freedom does this structure have? Three. So, a frame where all the members are actually rigid okay, has three degrees of freedom. Now, what are those three degrees of freedom? Let us let us look at it. Okay. It is very interesting. What did I have in the previous case? Let us look at the previous case and let us look at this case and I am going to draw all the previous case ones. When I did not have the constraint of actual rigidity, these were the six degrees of freedom that I had. Now, let us look at what happens. 3 of those have to disappear, right? Because my kinematic indeterminacy for this structure is 3, right? So, I have to make 3 displacements disappear. How do I make? Remember, it is not 3 displacements that I am making them disappear or I am making them equal to 0. It may so happen that 2 displacements are equal to each other, in which case it is only 1 degree of freedom. Because remember, 
the kinematic indeterminacy is the minimum number of independent displacement quantities that I need to define to be able to dis give the displaced geometry. Now, if one degree of freedom is equal to another degree of freedom, then what happens? I need only one of them, right? Okay. So, therefore, let us look at this. Now, let us look at this degree of freedom. What does this entail? This joint is not going anywhere vertically. If this joint moves vertically, what happens? That means this member is being actually deformed, but it is actually rigid. So, therefore, what happens? I know that this displacement is equal to 0. Similarly, I know that this displacement equal to 0 because this displacement would entail this column deforming. What else do I know? Think about it. This member cannot actually deform. What does that mean? Think of this degree and this degree of freedom. What if this joint displaces by 1, how much will this joint displace by horizontally? Since this member is actually rigid if this displaces if this displaces horizontally by 1 so will this what does that mean that means that these two displacement quantities are the same they're going to have equal value so i need to only consider one of them so remember i'm not saying that this is equal to 0 no it's not equal to 0 however i'm eliminating this degree of freedom because this and this are the same i could do either one of them either this or this you could eliminate so, then what are my independent degrees of freedom for this actually rigid frame? One rotation, one rotation, two rotation, three horizontal displacement. Those are my three degrees of freedom for this actually rigid frame. So, you see it is fairly simple. There is no problem now you should have in computing the kinematic indeterminacy of a planar structure, be it a truss, a beam or a frame. How do you go? Find out the number of degrees of freedom per joint depending on whether you have a truss structure or a beam structure. If it is a truss structure, number of degrees of freedom per joint is 2. Find out the number of joints, multiply by 2, then find out the restraints and you got it. Remember that you cannot, an actual member cannot be constrained. Okay? Because if you stop the actual deformation of a truss member, what else is left? Nothing. It cannot deform at all. Okay? So, typically in a truss structure, you never have constraints. You only have restraints provided by the supports. When you come to a beam and a frame, if you do not stop any of the deformations, then you have 3 degrees of freedom per joint. Number of joints gives you the total unconstrained degrees of freedom. You find out the restraints, subtract them. Furthermore, if you want to stop the deformation, you want to neglect the deformation, not stop, you want to neglect the deformation of a particular member, then you have to consider that member as a constraint. So, if you stop the actual deformation, for each member you neglect the actual deformation, you have one constraint and you find out if you make all of them, then you have that many number of constraints. Okay? So, this is relatively simple. I hope that at the end of this treatise, you should be able to find out the kinematic indeterminacy and static indeterminacy of frames. I am now going to show one more constraint because you might have a constraint like this. Think about it. And this beam is totally rigid. In other words, this beam cannot deform actually or flexurally. What happens in such a situation? You see, axial constraint I have already shown it is 1, 1 for axial. How many for flexural constraint? Because you are making it flexurally rigid also now. How many constraints? Let us look back at this 
simple beam. How many degrees of freedom does this beam have? It's actually rigid, right? So how many degrees of freedom? One, two. Now let me make this beam totally flexually rigid. It can't, it can't bend. If it can't bend, what happens? This is zero, this is zero. So if you have flexural rigidity, how many constraints per member? Two. So therefore, let me look at this. How many degrees of freedom? Remember that when this was not flexually rigid, we had three, de three degrees of freedom. So I'm going to start from there. Three degrees of freedom. How many constraints? Additional constraints? Additional constraints due to flexural rigidity. Two. How many degrees of freedom? One. What is that? This one. Okay. So that's all. That's all I have to say. Now I want to show you some structures and we will go through and compute how you are going to compute the um, kinematic and static indeterminacy of these frames. So let's look at the first frame. What is this? This is a propped cantilever. Okay? It's a statically determinate structure. Why? Because if you look at it, how many support reactions? Four. And how many equations of equilibrium? Three. So it's a static and indeterminate structure. Now let me have a look at another one. Here, what you have is you have this joint. You have the left joint which you have allowed it to move horizontally. You moved, allowed it to move horizontally. If you allow it to move horizontally, look at what happens. Suppose I apply a horizontal load to this beam. What's going to happen? Think about it. This beam is going to move because there is no horizontal restraint. It only has two horizontal vertical restraints and a moment restraint to the left end. This structure is unstable. Okay. So, therefore, understand one thing that it's very important before you start looking at static indeterminacy, you need to know whether it is unstable or stable. And you can only find out the indeterminacy of stable structures. Look at this. This is stable. It's a cantilever. Okay. Now, let us look at <coughs> certain uh, point. Let's look at this particular member. Look at the top. How many degrees of freedom do you think it has? Well, think about it. There's one frame, one member. How many joints? Two joints. Okay. There are two joints here, one here, one here. So, two joints. How many? Uh, degrees of freedom. So unconstrained, two joints, you have two into three. How much is that? Six. So you have unconstrained degrees of freedom is six. Now let's look at the restraints. Restraint, this joint is fixed. Fixed, how many constraints? Uh, sorry, restraints, three. What about this restraint? One. So how many restraints total? Four. 4, so that means unconstrained, 6 minus 4, 2 degrees of freedom for this structure. What are the 2 degrees of freedom? One is this and one is this rotation. So this displacement and this rotation. Now in addition to that, I am going to say that this is actually rigid. This is implicit. You know, I do not even have to state it. Typically for a beam, unless you explicitly allow actual deformation, you assume it to be actually rigid. So if it's actually rigid, constraint, one. How many degrees of freedom? One. Which is that? This rotation. So kinematic indeterminacy, one. Static indeterminacy, how do I go about it? Well, three plus one, four. Four. So how many equations of equilibrium? Three. Okay. So what is the static indeterminacy? One. So this structure has 
a single kinematic indeterminacy and a single static indeterminacy. Let's look at a few other structures. Let me look at this structure. What is this? This is a multi-span beam. In a multi-span beam, what is this is the structure? I need to find out its number of degrees of freedom and the static indeterminacy. Simple static indeterminacy, if I remove this, it becomes statically determinate. So, there is only one static indeterminacy. Kinematic, how many? Let us go through it. 1, 2, 3, 3 into 3, 3 into 3, 9. How many restraints? 1, 2, 3, 4. Restraints total 4, then 9 minus 4, 5. Static indeterminacy is 1 and kinematic indeterminacy is 5. Let us quickly look at another structure. This structure. How many redundant forces? Well, I am not going to go into this. 1, if I release this and I release this totally, I get a simply supported beam. So, it has 4 redundant forces. So, static indeterminacy is 4. Kinematic, 3 degree, 3 joints, 1, 2, 3, 3 into 3, 9. Restraints, 3 here, 3 here, 1 here. So, 2 degrees of freedom and you are shown the 2 degrees of freedom. You have a truss. For a truss, what is the static uh, redundancy? Remember that each one is triangulated. So, it is internally determinate and if I remove one of these, so if I remove this, it becomes 3, it becomes externally determinate also. So, this is the only redundant force. So, the static indeterminacy is 1 and the kinematic you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 into 2, 12, 12 minus 4 restraints, 2, 1, 1, 4 restraints gives you kinematic indeterminacy 8. Look at a frame structure, we have already seen this, it is 3 and 6, static indeterminacy 3, kinematic indeterminacy 6 and that brings us to the end of this lecture. So, therefore, at the end of this lecture, I am going to assume from here on out that given any structure, you should be able to find out its static indeterminacy and kinematic indeterminacy or kinematic indeterminacy I replace sometimes by degrees of freedom. Okay? Thank you. So, we will continue next time by looking at some methods from which we can use to do our structural analysis.